Stand by for action. Thanks for joining me. My name is Dave Miller. I am the Unpleasant Blind Guy. As everyone is understanding now, battle has been engaged here in the United States with the new Trump moratoriums on immigration from Islamic countries into the United States. And the leftist press, entertainers, and generally people who don't know much about the impacts of Islamization on a country are in full-throated beast roar in opposition. Now, you guys have heard me talk often enough about the dangers of Islamization, both here on my show and on the English Defense League radio program. But it's different when you actually hear it from someone from a country that is more affected by Islamization than the United States of America. People, there's a reason why I keep warning about this problem, and there's a reason why I say that we need to not only stop the immigration, but we need to begin reversing it and sending Mohammedans to the Middle East. And to that end, I'm speaking with Leslie Ann Stoffel. Now, she is someone from Canada who is very well plugged in to the issue of Islamization in her own country. And she is going to provide us with some nice information. Leslie, welcome to the Unpleasant Blind Guy. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be with you. I'm a big fan. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate that. No, I absolutely appreciate that. Now, the last time we spoke was on election night when yeah. we did a great show with Kel Fritzy of Red Fox Radio, and yeah. we had Gotti Edelman with us, and we had Vlad Tepes, and we had uh, Mike Holes of Australia. It was a planet-spanning show, and yeah. one that I'm really proud, of, actually, to have been a part of. And I have to ask first, because <laughs> the reactions are still coming in from around the world, even though it's been a while now. What was the reaction on your side from the west coast of Canada, where you are, <laughs> to the Trump election? What did you see just generally talking to people and through the media? Oh, man. Well, the people here on the whole are very leftist, and our media is very leftist. And I've had some real problems. I actually was sort of verbally attacked at a job I was at. And I actually quit the job because they were abusive to me over my support of Trump, if you can believe it. They just would not stop. And I actually left because they wouldn't listen to reason. They just allowed themselves to be brainwashed. And they wouldn't listen at all to what the truth was. And our media is very anti-Trump. I mean, they just completely repeat and repeat and repeat all the negative talking points that I guess are put out by the Hillary Soros media machine. That's what it seems like, because they all just repeat the same uh, negative talking points. Even if the story is a positive thing, even if what he does is something positive, they turn it into something negative and then they just repeat it. So we're, there are some like my dad actually is a Trump supporter. There's little pockets of people that get it. But on the whole, people are brainwashed by the leftist media. And it's really sad to see. And I think that's why I spend a lot of my time. I've taken upon myself. I'm on Twitter a lot. I'm on Facebook a lot. I did start my own radio show, too, to refute these leftists. And they're not even liberal anymore. I mean, this is regressive leftism. You know, a liberal is somebody who believes in free speech and who would never couple themselves with a fascist, Islamo, uh, Nazi type of ideology. This is regressive leftism. It's going backwards. And so I've taken this upon myself to fight this sometimes very exhausting uphill battle of what we're facing here. Right. Now, you say, Leslie, that you have a new podcast and... To that vein, I want to ask you, how much of an impact do you think the new mainstream media, and I'm talking about the non-standard folks like you and myself, oh, let's say Vito Esposito, Gotti Edelman, and people of that nature, how much of an impact would you say that all of those people and all of the rest have had on this 2016 election 
And uh, how much of an impact do you think they're going to have moving forward? I have been following this so closely. I'm, I'm on it like 24 seven. And I believe we all had a big impact. I even had a friend of mine from Washington state because I was tweeting, oh my gosh, 24 seven about the WikiLeaks thing about Hillary and everything. And he thanked me. He said, thank you so much for tweeting all that stuff or posting all that stuff because it made a difference. And I said, did it really? He said, yes, it really did. And that's just one little you know, story, but I believe it does. I follow all these alternative media guys now, you know, and all you, the people that you mentioned and everything. And I believe it had a big impact and I believe it will ha continue having a, a larger impact as we go forward because the media that we have on our, what's been considered the mainstream media, they do nothing but lie and smear and are a propaganda machine. And normal people who want to know the truth and who want to think for themselves are sick of it. And so this new media that we're involved with is growing, 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 and I can see it growing and morphing into something really good in the future. So yeah, it does get a little discouraging sometimes because you think, oh, gee, am I making a difference at all? Whatever. But I think it's like Pamela Geller says, we're in a, the battle of the information battle space, and we need to just keep soldiering on each and every one of us, all of us with our spheres of influence make a massive difference and anybody even who's listening who wants to start their own thing is great blogging i do writing blogging you know all sorts of stuff whatever you can do it just helps and it's really quite fun actually too and you meet lots of really interesting people right. yeah well just tell them not to take my time slot okay <laughs> no, no i'm kidding i'm kidding <laughs> even though it is all about me now um <laughs> Um, what you're saying makes an awful lot of sense with us here in the United States. It's pretty much the same thing. And this is important, guys, for anyone who wants to start up something like this, a blog or a show or whatever you can do to get the information out. We have one thing that pretty much all of what I call the state stream media does not have. A lot of us are not dependent on sponsors. So we can make our shows, our programs our blogs, whatever, as long or as short as we need to. And you can get good information within about a five-minute period in some cases. There's Andrew Claven, for instance, who does yeah. The Revolting Truth. Fantastic stuff. And it's usually only about five to maybe seven minutes, about as long, if you're an older person, as an old Popeye cartoon used to be. But in that, you get a ton of information that you can go out there and spread around and you can use in this fight to save civilization. And right. I'm not just talking about American or Western civilization, civilization itself. And that brings me, lastly, to another question that just popped into my frond, into my head, for uh, those of you who watch Stargate SG-1. <laughs> now, this battle that we're in with Islamo-progressivism, which is what I call it. Yeah. That's a good term. Thank you. Is going to bring in strange bedfellows. Do you see people like Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin as those kinds of strange bedfellows? Because when I say that Islam threatens all of civilization, it even is a threat to Russia and China. China has banned yes. Islam in at least one of its southern provinces. So there's the question. I think I'm like a lot of people. I'm in the process of kind of feeling this out because I'm looking with a bit of a jaundiced eye at Russia, but I'm thinking, hey, on the other hand, we need Russia because they're under threat, so we're going to need them to help to crush some of this Islamic State stuff in the Middle East, and then gosh knows where it's going to go from there. But yeah, there are going to be, I think, some strange couplings of countries coming up that we wouldn't really have ever imagined before. It's true. Right. And I want to remind people that in the Second World War, the Allies sided with Joseph Stalin, who, mm -hmm. had, who had a horrible human rights record. If you look back from his purges and other things that he did inside the Soviet Union in the 1930s, he did stuff that almost that makes Hitler look like a second story man. But we mm -hmm. needed him at the time to defeat Nazi Germany and then later Japan. So for those who are concerned about Putin's human rights record, and trust me, I'm every bit as concerned as you are, 
the human rights record of Mohammedans who have taken off the mask of taqiyya that they wear here in the United States and in other Western countries is far, far worse. And all you have to do is go back and listen to some of my shows, and you'll hear of some of the things. Or all you have to do is, for instance, go to Jihad Watch and read what Robert Spencer has there. It will yeah. blow your mind. Now, on the Trump election, mm -hmm. Leslie, how do you see Donald Trump getting along with your prime minister, Justin Trudeau? Oh, well, okay. We've had uh, this O'Leary, that's his name. He's going to be, he's running for the, a, the conservative race here in Canada. He used to be on Dragon's Den. He called it Bambi meeting Godzilla. And that's how it's going to be. We've also got the added thing here, Dave, of Trudeau, our prime minister. We call him affectionately Ian Zoolander. He's got nice hair and he looks like a model. And he was a drama teacher. He is a puppet of Soros. And that's not an exaggeration. That is true. He's a Soros puppet. So after today, when President Trump put on this three month moratorium on these having immigration from these seven different Islamic countries, what did Trudeau do? Oh, well, he went on Twitter and said, they're all welcome in Canada, just to shove it up Trump's nose, okay? So I'm going to say that they'll probably keep a cordial thing going publicly, but this is going to be ridiculously stupid for Trump to have to deal with this idiot that we have as our prime minister. Well, as you know, well, well, as you know, uh, Donald Trump has no problems dealing with idiots on Twitter, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I don't think that Prime Minister Trudeau needs to challenge him there because I think the results would be pretty ugly. But <laughs> Trudeau, though. Very interesting character. Now, for those of you Americans who are into history, recall or just go online and look for some of the videos, some of the remarks and observations that were made in 1960 during that election because there was a young, vibrant, good-looking guy running, and his name was John F. Kennedy, and people voted for him just based on his looks and vitality. Then in 2008, there was another guy named Barack Hussein Obama who seemed young and vital and, I suppose, fairly good-looking and things of that nature, and people rushed to vote for him for that reason and for others. Let me ask you a question, Leslie. Is there any or how much of buyer's remorse is there now in Canada you guys have had Prime Minister Trudeau for a little while. How many Canadians, far as you can observe, there on the West Coast, hmm. seem to have issues now with this guy? Is anybody sorry they voted for him? Here's the thing. When it comes to our propaganda media, I can't get a straight answer, of course. So I have to read what I can read off of social media. And what I can tell is there are people rising up. I don't know exactly what the percentages would be, but there are people with buyer's remorse now. And there are people, this has gotten into quite a high percentage. I have found out that I think it's in the 70% range that Canadians are not happy with this flooding our country with Muslim immigrants. That's a big part of it because he didn't run on that. He didn't run on this overzealous need to change Canada into a Sharia compliant country. And that's what people see happening because he is now also, they're putting in a bill. It will be against the law. You'll be called an Islamophobe. It will be against the law to say anything against Islam. And so this is something I'm going to be calling our MP about because this can't happen. If I, I'm, I'm against violent jihad and I'm against Sharia law, then that makes me an Islamophobe? I don't think so. You right. know? And President Obama did not run on speeding up the Islamization of our country either. But no. as we saw, that's exactly what he did. Now, it has to be said 
that Islamization began, quite frankly, under President uh, George H.W. Bush. That was Mm -hmm. when it began to increase from a fairly small number before that. But as soon as things like wars in Africa and things like that sprouted up, the trickle began from various countries over there and in the Middle East. And with each succeeding president, it got a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more until President Obama came in and he was able not just to open up the tap but to turn on the fire hose. It's not nearly as bad, I understand, as it is in Canada as far as how many Mohammedan immigrants are being brought in, but it is still a quantum leap above what had happened before. And Mm -hmm. this is relevant to Canada and to the United States. I mean, guys, we share a border with Canada, so Mohammedans from Canada can easily hop over here to the United States. Yes, because, Dave, there are places where you can literally just walk over the border. There isn't a border. Like, there's just miles and miles of trees. Dennis Michael Lynch has done uh, documentaries on this. There are places where the, the lakes freeze to the point where you can actually walk over them, and people can walk over into the U.S. So this is a very dangerous security and safety issue, not just for us, but for you guys. And also, putting aside even the safety issues, I'm so concerned about the Sharia mindset. I mean, these people come in and they have only known Sharia law. That's it. Our West liberal Western democracies are anathema to them. They want to implement their Sharia law. And that is one of my big fears, too, is that aspect of it. Hey, it's just so frightening, you know, to think that here President Trump is trying to protect his citizens. So what is our idiot? Prime Minister do say, oh, you're all welcome here. And where's the first place they're going to head to? The U.S. border. So to me, that it's just very, very dangerous for him to have done that. I think it's going to set the tone of the relationship with President Trump in a very negative light, because I actually tweeted that back. I sent that tweet to President Trump so that he would see it. And I also put Ezra Levant in there, too, because Ezra does shows on this. Ezra is a Uh, Canadian journalist with the Rebel TV here, and he does programs on this, and he's just written a book on Trudeau and Trump. And so I sent it to him as well, because this, to me, was like a huge red flag. It's very, very bad. Well, do you think that Justin Trudeau will do what he can with these Mohammedans that do come into Canada to make sure that they stay in Canada? Uh, How much of a threat do you think it is that those people would just hop over this very porous border? And by the way, folks, what Leslie is saying is absolutely true. I've seen stories about this for years. And of course, before, no one really cared because the United States and Canada are good friends. But now it's becoming an issue. Do you think that Justin Trudeau will do what he can to keep track of this new crop of Mohammedans that he wants to welcome in to Canada that Trump is publicly rejecting? Look, I don't think he cares. And the reason is, is because he's a puppet of Soros. And Soros' plan is to Islamicize the West. And however he can do that is how he can do it. So if these people come in here and they happen to go across the border into the U.S. and cause problems and safety issues and whatever, honestly, Trudeau does not care. If he cared, he wouldn't be doing it in the first place. No, nor would he be doing it to the people of Canada as yeah. far as as far as far bringing in all of the Mohammedans. Now, how much, and yes, I know your media is all on board with Islamization, but just talking to people, how much of an impact will a pack of Mohammedans have on a, uh, a given Canadian town? Well, in my town, for instance, the United Church here in town has been actually bringing them in, which really, really pisses me off. And the people in the town, Canadians are known to be fairly docile and I think in a lot of ways they're quite naive. And the people in this town have been very naive about the ones that have been brought in here. And it's really hard to say. I mean, as we can see, as the numbers grow, that's when the problems really start. 
So we haven't, in my town, it's not grown to that level yet, but it will. And then the problems that they have in Germany and France and Sweden, whatever will happen. Now they've had larger numbers be brought into places like I think Fredericton on the East Coast. And the young girls at the schools have already been sexually harassed and had had problems with that and it's been covered up because again the rebel media has gone in the only media in Canada to do any stories on it have gone in to do stories on it and it's been covered up by the school system and whatever and the parents are actually turning to the rebel media for help and so where they've been brought in these young men who are brought into the school as though they're children they're really not they're in their 20s or late very late teens and they're going after these 13 14 year old girls uh, this, again, is another ruse. You've seen this in England, too, where they brought in these guys. But they're pretending that they're children and they're not. So we are in pockets. We're having issues. Also, there's been a machete attack in Vancouver just recently. So we're having these different pockets of problems, but they are being covered up by the, what would we call it? I'm calling it the mainstream media, but we need a better name for it because it's not mainstream at all. Well, it's, uh, I call it personally the state stream media because they're following yeah. the dictates of the state. In fact, here in the United States, the state stream media has people in it who were married in some cases to people in the Obama administration, literally in bed with the administration in the White House. So from that, folks, you can tell how non-biased they're going to be, and frankly, as I see it, you guys have even more problems in Canada with your media. As uh, mm -hmm. people like Michelle Walsh point out, you know, and Michelle wants to put an end to the CBC, which yeah. I think is a great idea, by the way. So you guys have a much larger problem getting the truth out. And mm -hmm. the problems, by the way, people that Leslie is talking about, I can confirm they happen in the United Kingdom. You have these young men, and that's what they are, being put into these primary schools in the U.K., and if they're not shaving, and some of them are, um, they're just mm -hmm. about ready to, and they're being yeah. put in with 12- and 13-year-old girls, these problems are occurring. Again, Leslie, is it worse in the bigger cities where there are larger concentrations of Mohammedans? Because this is the point that I always try to make to the listeners, which is that when you have a small group of Mohammedans that move into an area, usually they're peaceful. And yeah. this bolsters the narrative that Islam is a religion of peace and all of that. But as people in the UK and Europe and other places have found out, when the concentration of the Mohammedans reaches a certain point, especially if they're in democracies or republics like the United States, they begin to demand power, and for them, power is Sharia. That's when you begin to see the rape gangs, the Sharia patrols, and demands for Sharia-compliant media and government. Now, yeah. how bad has that gotten in, say, the larger cities in Canada? It is definitely worse in the larger cities. In Vancouver there, there was recently the machete attack. There have been numerous machete attacks because there's a large Somalian population in Edmonton, Alberta. Mm -hmm. That's in the next province over from me. Right. So they've had a good amount of issues like that. So yes, wherever there's a larger population of them, there are a lot more problems, and it definitely does happen in the city. Yes. All right. Now, I want to get to something that's important you guys had a ruling, I think this was last year, from your Supreme Court that stated that even telling the truth about Islam does not shield someone from the hate speech laws that exist in Canada right now. And by the way, that people want here in the United States, folks. Am I right about that ruling? Yes, because we don't have a First Amendment like you guys do. So speech here is subjective. As an example, again, I'll bring up Ezra Levant because he's such an outspoken person on all of this. When he had a small paper, he printed those Muhammad cartoons, those Danish cartoons, and he was taken to a tribunal for that. And uh, Mark Stein also as well. Now, it cost him thousands and thousands of dollars 
I believe he did win on that one. But on a latest one, he wrote something true about a Muslim on his blog. And this person actually took him to this, I think it was the Human Rights Tribunal. But this time, he was found guilty. So they can be subjective with the way they interpret what you say. So your speech is not sacrosanct. You don't have a First Amendment, so it's not within the bounds of this certain law. So, yes, you can be in trouble for saying certain things here, and it'll especially get worse if they pass this Islamophobia law. Okay, now let's be clear on this. When I say that people cannot be shielded from these hate speech laws, even if they're telling the truth, what I mean, and uh, you can confirm or deny this, Leslie, is that They cannot be shielded from hate speech laws and penalties for speaking out against Islam if they tell a truth about Islam, such as that the Prophet Muhammad did marry and eventually have sex with a nine-year-old girl. That is the truth. That can be Uh found found in Islamic writings, like the Uh Quran, for instance. All right. You know, I just want you to confirm that that is what we're talking about when we talk about truth. We're not talking about Rahid wears red shirts on Thursdays, right? Yeah, no, you're right. There was a pastor in Toronto who was out on the street preaching, and he actually spoke the truth about Islam from the text and everything, and he was sent to prison for something like a year. Okay, and this is the reason that I have Leslie on, folks. Canada is right next to us, and as you just heard her say and me confirm, the border is very porous. So President Trump, if he does the right things concerning Islam, even if he does, the Islamic threat is still there and coming down from Canada. And if we do not deal with Islamo-progressivism and stop any attempts to constrict our free speech about Islam so that the people will know what Islam is and what Mohammedans do when they come to civilized nations, we are going to be in a vast amount of trouble to the point where we might actually lose our civilization because this is what Mohammedans do. Just check around the Middle East and you will see that the Middle East has not always been Muslim as is now actually being claimed. But the Mohammedans there moved from one country to another and they increased their populations until they overwhelmed the local populations And then they used Jihad of the Sword to take care of the business that they wanted to take care of, which was the Islamization of that nation. And suddenly, for instance, Syria becomes an Islamic nation. Or suddenly, Egypt becomes an Islamic nation. Now, Leslie, I want to get into another story here. This one's about Justin Trudeau. Yeah. Okay. And this is just a mind blower for me. The reason that I want you to talk about this story is because when we in the new mainstream media say that our leaders and the people who would be our rulers are taking money from rich Islamic countries to allow this invasion of Muslims into our nation, Mm -hmm. we are being told that we are full of it, that we're liars, that we're thisists and thatists and thisophobes and thataphobes and right-wing extremists and blah, blah, blah. But... A story came out recently about Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Now, this one comes from Breitbart, and the headline on it is Justin Trudeau breaks his own ethics rule with a Bahamas trip on an imam's private jet. And Mm -hmm. this story is by Francis Martel, and it's dated the 13th of January, if you want to go and look for that story. Now, Leslie, do you want to comment on this story? Well, yeah, this is a huge, huge deal because Justin Trudeau spent New Year's Eve on the private island owned by the head of the Ismaili branch of Sharia Islam, the Aga Khan. And I don't know if you know this, he was missing in action here in Canada. Nobody knew where he was. And so the media is going, oh, well, um, we don't know where he is. I've never seen this happen in my life, where a prime minister just disappears. So he meant to do this, and he meant to cover it up, and he meant to lie. And he's not supposed to be taking private trips on private jets 
to these islands with these so-called, he, he calls him a family friend. Well, so what is your family friend? You're supposed to be cutting ties. Your, your job now is to be the prime minister of Canada. And it also came out in this that he had given millions of dollars to the Aga Khan. It just goes on and on and on, Dave. It just bodes very ill for what we're facing with this guy. Well, and that's the thing. Folks, imagine what would happen, and now I know there's some people on the left who would love this to happen permanently, but imagine what would happen if President Trump were to just disappear seemingly off the face of the earth for, let's say, a week. There would be almost panic in the streets, and yeah. and that is the equivalent of what happened there in Canada with Justin Trudeau. And, of course, we know that there is plenty of money in Islamic countries to be brought over to civilized nations partly because it's oil revenue. These are petrodollars that have been spent in this way. Now, I'd like to finish up this with a little talk about the Muslims in Canada and the women of Canada. Now, we have been talking here in the United States, those of us who have been observing what's been going on in Europe, the UK, Canada, Australia, and Africa, nations like that, we have been speaking the truth about Islam. When it comes to issues like gang rape, when it comes to issues like sexual assault mm -hmm. and things of that nature, well, just tell me briefly, what is it like for the average Canadian woman now in, oh, let's say Toronto or Montreal or a smaller town? Well, there are Muslim rape gangs already that have struck in the, I believe it was the Montreal area. And like I've said, we've had these sexual assaults within the schools now. See, our population in Canada is very spread across a very large country. So right at this moment, it's happening in certain pockets where these problems and issues with the Muslim men is going on. But as we know, all we have to do is look at other places where the Muslim population has grown and it will get worse. You know, it's starting out small right now, but it, it will grow as we know. So that's our concern. We want to stop it before it gets to that point. You know, we'd rather stop it now, right? Well, exactly. And if you look at the Easy Meat Report, which was prepared in the United Kingdom, you see that they began having problems with sexual assaults and things officially about 20 years ago. Unofficially, yeah. it's been more like 30 years. And one has to conclude from that and from the population of Muslims that's in the UK now, vis-a-vis -vis the population of native people of the UK, that these problems have to already be going on in Canada and in the United States. Mm -hmm. I, I do know that, according to Michelle Walsh, the pamphlet Islam from Darkness to Light, which you can find various forms of on the Internet, has been passed out there to the male population of Canada and to other people, is full of things like Sharia-compliant behavior for men towards women. We're talking here, people, about wife-beating, we are talking about rape, in other words, sex with your wife, whether she wants it or not, and things of that nature. That is something you should take a look for. It can be sometimes hard to find, and I believe that this is because the Mohammedans realize that if something like this gets out, it's not going to make them look good. But this was being openly passed around on the east coast of Canada. Mm -hmm. And my guess is it's also been passed around on the west coast in the Vancouver area. This There's is... something I just remember, Dave, just recently, it could have been last week, in uh, Ontario, there are certain areas where the schools are that the Muslims are wanting prayer, they want prayer rooms, they want special treatment. A lot of this is being pushed in the schools. So I guess that must be a soft target, an easy target. So that's a lot of where their focus is within the schools. Oh, yes. Well, we see this here in the United States with Common Core as far as propaganda goes. And with the Mohammedans, we see this in states like Michigan, where Islamic prayer is allowed. But if anyone tries to take a knee and pray to Jesus before a football game here in the United States, 
they get a uh, nasty gram from the ACLU, which yeah. is frankly compliant with the Islamo progressives. So the American Civil Liberties Union, and I'm sure there are equivalent groups in Canada, really has nothing to do anymore with civil liberties. At this point, if there are any civil liberties that these groups fight for, it is for the civil liberties of Mohammedans mm -hmm. over anyone else. So we have that problem as well. Now, let me ask you about hope for a second. What kind of hope do the people of Canada, people you've talked to, have that you can get this situation changed, that you can get people like Justin Trudeau out of office and possibly reverse some of this Islamization, move the Overton window a little bit so that people can be better informed about Islam and things of that nature. As the Trump election and the rise of people like Geet Wilders and Marie Le Pen and Victor Orban given you folks in Canada some hope? Well, I think it has, again, judging from what I see on social media, I really think it has. And we have a number of people running now for the leadership of the Conservative Party who are coming straight out and saying, there's one lady called Kelly Leach. She's coming right out and saying, we must have screening for anti-Canadian values. For instance, you know, we must screen these people for their Sharia compliant mindset and beliefs and whatever. And there are a number of different people within that conservative race who are talking like this and people are accepting it. And I see more and more people on Twitter, for instance, coming out and saying, look, we've got to stop this guy. <laughs> like I say, Canadians, I think, are quite docile and naive and they're slow to sort of wake up and they don't want to be called racist. They don't want to be mean and all this kind of stuff. But I think they are slowly waking up to the fact that as they can see what's happening in Europe and the Trump effect, putting a stop to it, people can rise up and make a difference, turn the ship around kind of thing. I think that that might be happening. I really, really hope it is. From what I can see, it looks like it. Well, that's great. And we'll keep a hope and we'll definitely keep a prayer for all of our countries. Now, Leslie... How can people contact you? What organizations do you represent and things of that nature? Because Leslie is someone who is worth following on social media and listening to. You're a great conduit for information, Leslie. So please tell the people how they can contact you and about well, your show. Please tell the people about your show as well. <laughs> oh, I will. Okay. I work for United with Israel. United with Israel is located in Israel, but I also work when I'm in Canada. I work for them here and there. I do their donations. I do write some blogs for them. And also I do some social media for them as well. I have my own thing, though, which is Real Clear Israel. So my website is therealclearisrael.org. And all of my stuff is there, actually. I've got my show on there, which is Real Clear Israel Radio. I've got all my blogs on there, my social media. They can follow me on Twitter at Real Clear Israel. And my Facebook page is Leslie Ann Stoffel. And also I have a Facebook page, Real Clear Israel. But everything really can be found on my web page, which is therealclearisrael.org. And I'm not all about Israel, although I, I do pro-Israel things. But I, as you have heard here, I'm also, uh, I'm, I'm anti-jihad anti and pro-Western values and pro the pro-West. So that's what I write about and talk about and try to spread that message around. So that's all about me. Well, I can assure you that there are people here in the United States who are behind the freedom efforts in Canada and in all of these other countries. I view it as the new civil rights movement, every yeah. bit as important as the civil rights movement of the mid-1960s was. And I believe that we have a lot of hope. Everyone, please follow Leslie at Facebook and go to her website, and you'll find out when the shows are on. I'm sure they'll be fabulous and and I'm already talking like President Trump. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be fabulous. You won't believe how fabulous they are. <laughs> and, Leslie, I want to thank you very much for being on The Unpleasant Blind Guy this time. And 
as you do, I stand with Israel. And I just want to say, God bless you. God bless the people of Canada who are working to free their people from Islamo-progressivism. You have a friend down here and across the uh, continent in The Unpleasant Blind Guy. Please come back at some point if you'd like to, and thank you again. Oh, I'd love to. Thank you, Dave. It was wonderful to talk to you. Okay, and with that, folks, that is it for this time. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for listening, and may your God go with you. Goodbye. The Unpleasant Blind Guy is copyright 2017. Anno Domini.